So this, uh, this talk I'm filling in for my colleague Shil Parsi, uh, talking about programming on-chip components to retrieve sensor data, uh, which is lovely low-level stuff and is mm, a really good example of sort of how an open ecosystem and you know, open power itself can enable sort of innovation and thinking outside the box even within a company like IBM. But let's go. Uh, so a bit of agenda what we'll go through, talking about uh, getting sensors through here and in and out of the OCC and how we can actually take something that is currently a higher latency uh, way of getting measurements and turning it into something that's much lower latency. On a basic level, sort of open power provides us a platform uh, to program on-chip components, right? I mean, a Power 8 chip has many, many, many different parts of it that can execute instructions. Uh, so there's everything from... Uh, the on-chip controller, which is an embedded PowerPC 405 chip, uh, which does the uh, hard thermal limits and hard power usage limits. Uh, there's general purpose engines that the OCC use uh, to do some real-time stuff. There's the sleep winkle engine, uh, which is used to uh, turn on and off cores. So when you have uh, low power modes, uh, that Linux will say, hey, I'm not using that core. It can power it down and then power it back up. Uh, there's a self-boot engine, which is a tiny little microcontroller uh, that starts the chip up. Uh, and, of course, you have the power processes themselves, which is what everyone recognizes as your CPU. So within your CPU, you have a bunch of other things that look remarkably like CPUs, but aren't, in fact, your CPU. Uh, in fact, it is turtles all the way down, as you may imagine. Or if you're a Pratchett fan or otherwise, you will recognize the, the reference. Uh, so as part of the Open Power firmware, we have uh, the OCC code. Uh, and there's facilities there to provide interfaces to certain sensors, right? There's uh, sensors inside the box that measure things, everything from temperature to voltage to how much bandwidth is being used on what bus. Uh, the existing uh, mechanism uh, for reading sensors, you can do so via IPMI. So IPMI is a standard protocol for talking to BMCs, the baseband management controller uh, on servers. And this has been a spec that's been around for, you know, nearly long enough to drink in bars. Uh, but it's, it's quite warty, but it exists, and it's a standard that's cross-platform. Uh, so there's an IPMI tool you can run from another machine and interrogate uh, the power system or any other system, and you can use this wonderful interface, and wonderful I mean absolutely awful and not user-friendly at all, called IPMI tool raw, where you jump in a bunch of uh, magic hex values that looks oddly like having to make a sacrifice to get data out, but you, you get something back from it. And what that's doing is, is asking the BMC to get a sensor value out. And the way it works is this. So outbound IPMI is you have an external node, so like you know, your laptop or your management computer, uh, talking over a network to the BMC inside the computer. And then there's a direct interaction with the OCC. So the OCC will get data from a bunch of sensors and then tell the BMC about it. And then you can ask the BMC for those sensors. And this is sort of out of band getting sensor data. So you could ask, you know, what's the temperature of the processor? and it would tell you. Uh, there's also the ability to read these sen some of these sensors in band. There is in band IPMI. So that's directly talking from the host uh, to it itself. So here you have running uh, on, this, on an OS that's running on the Power 8 chip. So you could be on Ubuntu on the ship, on the machine, rather than using a remote machine and say, hey, what is the current temperature on this machine? So that's sort of an in-band rather than out-of-band. So we say in-band, it's running on the machine you're looking at. Out-of-band is getting at a different machine. Uh, so this way you would do it, you know, SSH to the box and find the information there. And in this case, the current sort of in-band method for getting these, these sensors would be that you'd run IPMI tool, which would talk to the host Linux kernel, which would then call a firmware routine, which then asked the BMC for the sensor data. So as you can imagine, with this sort of round trip, there are several round trips and several layers you're going through. And in fact, you're asking for a property of you know, the P8 chip, and you're going out to a separate processor inside the box to find out what's going on. So you can imagine there's a large amount of latency there. Uh, so while this gives you the joy of being able to get the same sensor data as you can get out of band, it does have a higher latency cost. Uh, and the way this works uh, is that uh, the OCC will use SCOMs. So SCOMs are simply just 
a way of talking to different components inside the P8 chip that's largely an, an implementation detail. Uh, inside in, inside the, the P8, of course, you have to have ways to communicate with different components inside the chip. This is ours. Uh, does anyone want a large, long, detailed version of, of what SCOMs do and what everything is there? Because if so, there's a bar and we should talk there. <laughs> it doesn't fit into 15 minutes at all. Uh, and the main thing here is you have like the digital sensors or analog sensors inside the system. And through SCOMs, you can have code that reads that. So the uh, OCC can use this method to then get the data. And then they can export it through some method. And we want to export this in a method that's lower latency than just going all the way through the BMC. So instead of just sending it to the BMC, we could do something else. For reading sensors in band, uh, we want to provide an interface to read the values of this through something that's standard, right? So for out of band monitoring, IPMI is the current industry standard. For in band, like if you're on a Linux system and you're wanting to know what's going on on it, there are existing Linux kernel interfaces for how to do that. Uh, you can get some sensor data through perf. So perf is very much performance counter oriented, as in you want to know, you know how many instructions per cycle are being executed on a core, let's say, or how many L2 cache miss misses have been occurring. Perf has a standard interface for this. So you type down at your system perf, and then magic happens and you get sensors, right? There is also the hardware mon slash LM sensors interface. Uh, and this is a way of getting other sensor information from a running Linux system. And you can run this like on your x86 laptop, and this is just the exact same kernel interface. So you can run perf on your laptop, and I run perf on my laptop, and I run perf on my power systems, and it uses the same kernel interfaces. So it's just standard, and we don't have anything you know, power specific on the user space side or from a user point of view. It just works. Uh, and what we want to do is have these other sensors that we have in the system available through these same interfaces. So why would we want to do this? Uh, the big key is that uh, we want to profile workloads that are running on a system. For many reasons, you might want to profile a workload. You might want to profile it for performance, as in are you using the hardware to its full capability? Or you may want to profile it for power consumption, as in are we doing a workload in a certain power envelope? Uh, and you may want to use this to feedback in to make your code better, or to then iterate on hardware designs and go, well, this workload isn't using the chip to its full potential. How can we change the chip so it does? Uh, so you can have that from a perspective of an application developer. Why do you need to profile it? Or from you know, chip designers and go back to them and go, well, if you change the chip this way, we'll use more of it. Uh, and the other issue, of course, is that uh, there's this small issue of when you observe a system, you may change what's going on. So you want to do this in the minimal impact way possible. And so we don't want to have uh, large amounts of changing to how the system operates just to measure what it's doing. So we do want to reduce the latency involved in reading the platform sensor data. And this also means we get much finer grained information. Right? If it takes a second to read a value, then you only have per second granularity. And on a modern system, you know, on a P8 chip, 10 cores, 4 gigahertz, 8 threads per core, a lot happens in a second, right? Like billions of things happen in a second. So that's obviously the smaller uh, uh, latency we have, lower overhead, the more data points we can gather and make intelligent decisions. Uh, we can also then export that data out to the world, right? If we have standard Linux interfaces, this means that other software such as OpenStack can use standard Linux interfaces to get uh, platform-specific sensor data and collate that across a cloud, which may be not just power chips. It could be x86 chips. It could be ARM chips. It could be any other kind of chip that also has sensors. Yeah, there's a preference for power chips, but like <laughs> may, may not be let yet on, on, on all situations. We'll, we'll see how we go. But uh, Having the standard interfaces means that someone developing this tooling for OpenStack doesn't have to care about any specific of a power CPU. They just get standard interfaces that are accurate and don't affect performance. The last thing you want to do is go, I'm going to monitor my cloud, and suddenly your performance drops by half. That's not what you want. 
So what is the actual latency we're talking about? Uh, so if we look at in-band OCC sensor, so if we run code directly on the OCC to pull data from the sensor, about 90 nanoseconds to read something. Uh, if we're doing a SCOM and go, we're going to read the sensor directly from the host, that's like 1,100 nanoseconds, which you may notice due to basic maths is a much larger number. If we're going in-band IPMI, so that means on the command line, we're like, we run an IPMI tool and it goes via the BMC to get the sensor. 80 milliseconds, you may notice a change in units there, which is, again, much longer. And if we're doing out-of-band IPMI, it's even longer again. So obviously, this would take a big effect of what kind of uh, uh, timing you can get for reading everything, as well as how much you're affecting the system, right? If it's going to take, if you're going to run something at 120 milliseconds and you're going to run that, you know, 10 times a second, obviously instructions and processor resources are being used there, so you're getting less accurate information and you're affecting the workload more. So the OCC we've been talking about uh, and that uh, Todd and others have spoken about is a tiny little PowerPC 405 embedded chip. Uh, so it's a CPU in its own right. It has uh, 512K of static RAM. Uh, and for those of us who grew up on systems that had much less than 512K RAM, you'll go, this is a luxury programming environment. And now it's considered an embedded chip. And that takes care of power management as its primary use. Uh, it has coprocessors that it offloads some work to. Uh, and what it does already is periodically read and store uh, many platform sensor data. And it does this to achieve its core goal, which is to do hard thermal limits and hard power consumption limits. So it reads, you know, what is the temperature of everything in the system? Do we have to throttle anything? So it may, Linux may say, I want to run at this frequency. And the OCC may read all of the temperatures and go, we are too hot. So we're not going to run at that frequency. We'll run at a lower frequency that will mean we keep within those thermal limits. Because it turns out that you shouldn't get too hot. Machines don't like that. Uh, and you shouldn't chew mu too much power because it turns out that data centers don't like that. Uh, and this does this at, at, at various iterations. And it has you know hard kind of real-time code running there to read everything as you go. Uh, and this is sort of how it looks like as a simplified diagram. Uh, the OCC itself has its own static RAM, but it can also talk to main memory as well. Uh, and it will indeed do this as an interface to the host firmware. So what can we do? Well, instead of having these sensors be out of band, we can program the OCC to copy the other sensors we want uh, from uh, the OCC SRAM and into main memory at a regular interval. Because the OCC has access to main memory, we can do that. And we can, in fact, add to that list of sensors that goes through that. Uh, we can then queue work on a block copy update engine, uh, which is uh, a little thread that will copy data from SRAM to main memory. And main memory is something that, of course, the host Linux system can access. Uh, and of course, we can pre-allocate this because there's a whole bunch of other things that happen with the OCC. So it's using existing infrastructure. And so this in-band sensor data would then work if we program the OCC to extract those sensors and copy that to main memory. We have this lovely little uh, workflow where our Linux user space application uses the standard Linux interfaces to talk to a Linux kernel. And inside that, we have a tiny little driver that simply reads from main memory. And periodically in the background, the OCC grabs those sensors and writes them into main memory. So when we're reading these sensors in-band on Linux, it's just reading from memory addresses, which is really, really quick, uh, while we have the OCC doing the hard work of pulling them uh, from outside that, and we're not using resources there. So how do we consume it? Memory mapped, all in memory, reading memory. Sensors, that's how we do it. Perf, LM sensors, sysfs files. So how could we use this? What information could this be useful for? Well, one is uh, just say in an OpenStack cloud environment, you could then provision your virtual machines based on memory bandwidth usage on each node, right? So if you have a known memory, if you have a machine that's all its memory bandwidth is consumed, maybe you want to provision uh, a new VM on a machine that has less of its memory bandwidth being used. So it can be another metric to go, you know, I know what IOPS are being used on each node. I know what... Uh, you know, network usage is being used on each node. Now I can also know things like memory bandwidth and temperature and then more evenly balanced things uh, across my, my cloud. Uh, that's also possible with uh, HPC uh, schedulers. So HPC 
schedulers have all sorts of input on like, what era would I schedule a job? And so we're having more smarts in there to go, well, if I'm scheduling a, a, a memory intensive job, guess what? I probably want to run that on a node that is not currently out of memory bandwidth. There is the IBM tradition of having backup slides at the end. Uh, but through this, you will be able to see uh, where you get sort of Linux perf interface, uh, be able to run a whole bunch of interesting workloads and then see some of these sensors. Uh, and this is a bunch of work that's come through uh, that's actually patches on top of what's in the current firmware. So this is actually sort of uh, something that has been noticed would be useful inside uh, you know, the Linux Technology Center. And we're now feeding back to the OCC teams going, hey, hey, we've made this useful thing with, the, with your firmware. So if you want to go and grab and play with this, uh, there is uh, patches for Ski Boot and there's patches for OCC. And the beauty of Open Power, of course, is like, here is patches to your host system firmware. Go compile and have fun with it. And that's what you can do. And we'll probably see this in sort of future generations of firmware and, uh, and, and chips as well and see this as an influence in future design. So with that, that's how you build a kernel to do it, how to build a PNOR with it, and thanks to all of these people who had a lot of, lot of involvement in this, and especially Shilpasi who, who led it. So thank you.